I did this for me, you see, so that I could improve. And then the byproduct of it being offered as a service came secondary to that. So it was not the primary goal of me learning. It was all for myself. And I think that's the best teacher because when you have gone through it yourself, you can relate to the person in front of you on the other side of the phone or the other side of the consultation and you know what they're telling you. You know, you can understand, you can empathize, you know, with it. And it's not like you're talking to a brick wall. There's empathy, you know, there's confidence because you have lived through it and got through to the other side and you live to tell the story, so to speak. And it gives a lot of hope to other women is what I believe. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD. Your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 159 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I have had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. So I am especially delighted to introduce you to Dr. Susan Vargas. Dr. Vargas is a general practitioner, family physician based in London and Dubai. She has over 20 years of extensive experience in women's health and internal medicine with a special interest in lifestyle medicine, menopause, ADHD, and holistic health. Her interest in ADHD stems from her own personal experience and awareness of ADHD traits, which became apparent in perimenopause during the COVID lockdown. I've heard that story often. She provides coaching and advisory services to assist women in their 40s and 50s with ADHD and menopause using an evidence-based holistic lifestyle approach and signposts to specialists. Susan, did I get all of that right? You summed it up perfectly well, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And I must say yours was one of the first podcasts I started listening to a few months ago when I was going through this at the start of my ADHD journey. So thank you so much. I feel privileged to be here. Well, thank you so much for being here. So can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Yes, fairly late. And it was just diagnosed some time ago during menopause in the COVID lockdown. And I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD in my childhood or teens. And as you well know, you know, the number of girls and number of women with ADHD who go undiagnosed uh, when they're especially supported during the early years is pretty high. So, you know, I lived in a society with firm boundaries, both in at school and in my family and home life. So I think because I did very well at school and into med school as well, it went undiagnosed uh, for a very long time. So it was only into my uh, mid-40s that a lot of the ADHD traits became apparent. So what were some of the symptoms 
the traits that you're talking about that you were starting to experience? I think uh, I'd probably say one of the main things I realized was it took me a lot longer to organize things than other people. And it could be organization, you know, personal life, you know, parties, or it could be just organizing my own life, you know, including things like laundry, you know, common things, you know, I could do complicated things very well, like in my medical profession. But when it came to more simplistic traits, like, you know, keeping on top of my accounting or laundry or cleaning and things like that. Those kind of things took a backseat. And also, I think my perfectionism, which kind of accounts for my consciousness at work, kind of looking after the health and well-being of other people, it left me quite exhausted. So that perfectionism drove me to the level of exhaustion, uh, which made me struggle. And this on top of, you know, kind of the physical symptoms of perimenopause with the tiredness and everything just compounded. And it was just like, it was a explosion, something that I didn't expect. So being a medical professional, you know, for me, it came as a shock and I found that really scary. So that's where my symptoms started. So were you, were you like me that initially you were like, <laughs> oh my gosh, do I have early onset dementia? <laughs> you don't know what all the questions I've asked myself. Is it early onset dementia? Or do I need to give up medicine? Or am I going crazy? The, all the usual things that women in their mid forties would ask went through my mind. You know, what if there's something else going on? The paranoia, the hypochondriac side of me kicks in. It's like, what is going on? How can I miss things? I shouldn't be missing things. I'm a doctor. So I think that put a lot of pressure on me to, on myself really, to be perfect. And I can't be this perfect Susan. So then who am I then if I'm not my usual Susan? I'm used to the one who gets 100%, who does everything perfectly. So I think, so I think that's where it kind of, came as a shock really so and that was a really difficult journey as well because you go down the spiral very quickly and uh, if you don't get the right support at the right time uh, and you're not surrounded by the right people you could end up somewhere in a really dark place and find it really hard to come back out of that spiral or the hole you have dug yourself in. Absolutely. Especially if you go to a medical professional and they they start telling you, oh, it's just anxiety. It's just depression. So here's medication for that, which then makes the ADHD symptoms often worse, right? Exactly. And I think I didn't even have the privilege of doing that because it was just at the beginning of the COVID pandemic and uh, London went into lockdown pretty quickly. So you couldn't really see anyone face to face medical professional wise. So and all the doctors were inundated with COVID patients. So you couldn't really uh, see anyone speak to anyone. So I think that added to the delay. But then it kind of empowered me because then it gave me the time, you know what, I have to research things for myself. I need to educate myself about ADHD. I need to educate myself about perimenopause. So I think the whole inspiration behind my coaching and advisory service for women with ADHD and or menopause stems from my own personal experience, my own journey. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, when someone has done the homework for you. And, yeah. you know, I, th I think I've been lucky because as a medical doctor, when I come across studies or journals and papers or articles, I have the discretion, okay, is it actually evidence-based? Is it sound yes. information? Because that's the thing I think a lot of women struggle with. They read a lot of rubbish in the media and you don't really know which who to trust, what to trust, and you know, where do you go next? So, And if you don't know where you're going next, you know, then you're in a dark hole and that makes things more difficult and it just adds to the frustration. And I think you asked me about the symptom coming back to it. I think the frustration of not knowing. And, you know, I think as perfectionists, as a high achiever, you always want to be in control, you know. And I think the the more control I lost, the more anx anx anxious I kind of became, the more controlling in my own uh, head. You know, I wanted to know everything I wanted to. I mean, it's a good thing because, you see, that's exactly what makes me a really good doctor, which is what I believe, you know, the flip side of the ADHD. I think uh, deciphering the information out there, that is the key and knowing what to trust and who to trust. So, so many of us were women 
Mm. were diagnosed because our kids were diagnosed. Exactly. How did you, and I know you're a doctor, but mm. so many doctors, they don't know about ADHD because they weren't taught about ADHD. It's just something out there that, you know, teenage, uh, not teenage, but, you know, young boys have. Mm. Did you always have experience with ADHD? And so you could recognize these symptoms and right away say, ah, that must be ADHD. Or how did that happen? Not at all. Far from it. Uh, none of the ADHD things were covered in the medical school curriculum. And, you know, if at all, like like you said, the hyperactive, overactive uh, young boys, that is the ADHD template every doctor has in their head. And I think it was coming into my mid 40s. And actually, it was my brother who's not a medical professional. And he was uh, reading through some resources for uh, men. And it was from a US based uh, ADHD coach and my brother turned around and asked me do you think you have ADHD and I was like what what, what made you even ask me that question so I was shocked and you know <laughs> and you know and like most people who are well educated and who think they know everything uh, and you know doc- and that's a lot of doctors for you and I kind of was very dismissive I was like no I don't have ADHD I would have known you know, if I'd had ADHD I wouldn't get through med school I wouldn't have all these qualifications, all these letters after my name. I don't think I would get to where I am today with the ADHD. So it was very, the dismissal comes from not knowing and the ignorance. But then you see, when you start struggling with it on a practical day-to-day level, you're forced to look yourself in the mirror and then examine what is out there. And I had to read everything from scratch and learn everything about it in the last, I would say, 18, 20 months. I did this for me, you see, so that I could improve. And then the byproduct of it being offered as a service came secondary to that. So it was not the primary goal of me learning. It was all for myself. And I think that's the best teacher because when you have gone through it yourself, you can relate to the person in front of you on the other side of the phone or the other side of the consultation and you know what they're telling you. You know, you can understand, you can empathize, you know, with it. And it's not like you're talking to a brick wall. There is empathy, you know, there's confidence because you have lived through it and got through to the other side and you live to tell the story, so to speak. And it gives a lot of hope to other women is what I believe. And I think that's what most women in their midlife need when they struggle uh, with these things. And, you know, when the double whammy, you know, perimenopause, hormones, ADHD, all these things hit you, you really don't know where to go and you lose hope. And once you start losing hope, the hopelessness can lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety symptoms. So recognizing these things early is the key is what I would say. Yeah. I always say our best purposes give meaning to our past. So exactly. Yeah. That's when you become the best teacher because you're so passionate about it too, because you want to help other people not struggle as much as you have. Yeah, that, that is exactly, you, you hit the nail on the head, Tracy there. So, okay. So I was telling you when we first started that I haven't had a doctor on the podcast for a (laughs) while. And I think it's really important that we talk Mm. about ADHD and hormones because Mm. I don't think it gets discussed enough. So the DSM-5 tells us that in order for ADHD to be present, the symptoms have to be present in childhood. And I can say for myself that I certainly had symptoms in childhood, but I think they were mild. I'll say they were primarily the good symptoms, like, you know, the drivenness, the no fear. Yeah, Yeah, I was chatty. I could be a little impulsive in speech, but I felt like that almost looked like fearlessness. Mm -hmm. And I always felt different. I kind of beat to my own drum, but I never saw that as a negative, right? In Mm -hmm. fact, I loved Mm -hmm. that I was different. And it wasn't until perimenopause that these serious symptoms like bad working memory, brain fog, you know, procrastination, mm-hmm. all of these things that, like I said, I, I thought I had early onset dementia and I yeah. was actually tested for Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. And you had made the comment that all of a sudden you started to notice problems with organization and accounting and laundry and, you know, cl- mm-hmm. just cleaning and keeping things kind of together mm-hmm. in your life. So my first question is, Were you able to handle all those things before, even though they bored you, but all of a sudden everything started to unravel or were these things always a problem and you just ended up having to do more and more of them? And so that's when the wheels fell off the cart. Do do you know? Uh, Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, I think I 
probably I found these kind of what I call as admin tasks very boring. You know, the laundry, the cleaning, the accounting. Oh God, do I have to do it? Or I, I'm a very last minute person when it comes to these kind of things because you see with ADHD, it's a very interest-based thing. And if you're not interested in the activity, then you're not going to do it. So I think, you know, I probably got through it, struggling through it. I got a cleaner to help me with the cleaning. Laundry, you know, I had to do it because I had to stay on top of things to function as a doctor. Uh, Accounting, I hired an accountant. So I think I did some things well. But I think when it came to the perimenopause, because there were the physical symptoms to go along with the cognitive symptoms uh, of you know, both ADHD and menopause is when I mm-hmm. actually started to struggle. You know, there was this uh, recent study and I think uh, the attitude, they had a webinar recently about it, you know, how there's an overlap of the yep. cognitive symptoms of both ADHD and menopause. Apparently about five of the main symptoms in ADHD and five of the cognitive symptoms of menopause are exactly the same. And that includes the classic kind of triad of the inattention, the impulsivity, the hyperkinesis, you know, the kind of the restlessness. So if you look at it, I think there's always been a relationship between the low estrogen and uh, the neurotransmitters. So the reason why women going into menopause struggle with ADHD or the other way around. I mean, you mentioned the ADHD being diagnosed usually when your kids are diagnosed. But perimenopause is kind of unmasked, in my experience, unmasks a lot of latent or hidden ADHD symptoms or uh, ADHD is diagnosed for the first time during the menopausal, perimenopausal years. So it could be either of those two. And I think looking back, there are some ADHD traits I possibly had during childhood, but because of the uh, the form boundaries within the structure of family and school, it never came out really. So it was kind of protected mm-hmm. and it was probably overlooked, which I think happens in a lot of women anyway. Uh, but I, you mentioned the Alzheimer's. It's a very interesting one. And the main reason uh, women uh, have that issue with the memory is mainly because of the one of the neurotransmitters, which is the acetylcholine. And that's the one which can be affected in Alzheimer's as well. And because it yeah. plays a central role in your memory, especially shorter memory and your learning. So that's where, as you see, you get the memory loss or the forgetfulness, the brain fog. You know, a lot of women say, you know, they've got a... Uh, Swiss cheese brain. I, uh, one of the psychiatrists uh, <laughs> wrote about it recently in the Daily Mail. Uh, actually, there was an article about it in the Daily Mail newspaper about ADHD and uh, menopause just two days ago. Daily Mail is one of the UK newspapers. And they talk about two women who are business women and who struggle with these two symptoms. So it is real. It is there. And it happens Okay. So ADHD symptoms increase when estrogen decreases and they decrease when estrogen increases. So, and that's, that's in every woman, right? ADHD or no ADHD. So then you add perimenopause or menopause on top of that (laughs) when your estrogen is bouncing all over the place, right? And then going down, it's no wonder that we struggle with all of those executive functions that, you know, are, okay, wait, what am I trying to say? The executive functions that it's dopamine, right? Yeah, exactly. And dopamine yeah. is controlled, or I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but dopamine is affected by our levels of estrogen. That's right, yeah. Because you see estrogen, uh, it kind of modulates the functioning of the neurotransmitters, uh, the three main ones being dopamine. So the dopamine has the central node in ADHD, especially with respect to executive functioning. And it's the low levels uh, of dopamine that cause the issues with uh, in ADHD. And when you have low estrogen, that affects the dopamine as well. And then the next uh, neurotransmitter that's affected, like I said, is the acetylcholine, which is to do with the memory and the learning. Uh, And the third one, which is also a very important one, is the serotonin. Uh, And that has is central in a kind of regulation of your mood and your fear, and which leads to kind of depressive or anxiety symptoms in perimenopause. You see a lot of women who are fine driving suddenly during perimenopause. They are scared of going on the road. Uh, They oh my gosh. They, they have really? Accidents. Yeah, because, it, you know, there's a lot of fear and then they're just generally quite anxious. 
And, you know, then they kind of lose keys, you know, that forgetfulness, they can't get projects on time, or then the mood is there. And then you see, because you don't know, or if you don't know what is going on, doctors wrongly give you antidepressants, which is not, which will help with the uh, serotonin side of things, but it doesn't really do anything about the estrogen side of things. So basically, a lot of women could be misdiagnosed or lately diagnosed with either of those two things. So... That's where the estrogen and the neurotransmitters kind of have a relationship. And it's the estrogen fluctuations during perimenopause, which can last from anywhere between two to 10 years, which creates the hormone havoc. So it creates havoc to the system. You really don't know if you're coming or going. So it's kind of basically lost. You know, Susan, I've never heard anybody talk about driving. So that is a symptom of perimenopause and menopause. Yeah, it could be. It could be because of the effect of it on the serotonin with the mood, the anxiety. So So that's serotonin. Yeah. So if you get on uh, behind the drive, uh, the wheel, and you're a bit anxious and, you know, you're breathing Mm. fast, you're going to overlook, uh, you know, people walking in front of you, behind you, around you, or if there's a lot of traffic, you could feel a bit panicky, restlessness, and then you're afraid you're going to have an accident, you're going to run, you know, and the ADHD heightens, so you might be running late for an appointment. I'm always running Mm -hmm. late. Uh, Mm -hmm. So then you drive fast or you cut corners, uh, you skip rules and then you end up in an accident and yeah there you go so the driving is a big one I think a lot of patients have told me that they struggle with you know I have never liked to drive I have never felt comfortable behind the wheel I think I probably had I can't even remember anymore but I think it was four accidents before the time I was 23 Mm. 24 Mm. but every single one of them except for one was someone Mm. running into me Right. Mm, mm. So I was already anxious because I feel like there's so much going on, but I'm not one of those ADHD people who speeds at all. Mm. I'm actually (laughs) quite cautious, but I've noticed over the last couple of years, I'm even more uncomfortable driving. And I think it's because I drive less. So I've Mm, been forcing mm. myself because Mm. I'm afraid that pretty soon I'm not going to drive anymore. Right. Because I'm going to be so anxious about driving, but it Mm. makes sense that it would be serotonin and i just thought oh it's adhd but Hmm. you know the dopamine yeah but it makes sense what you're saying that no it's more likely that maybe it's the serotonin because it is something that got much more um and it's not serious but i've noticed it more since perimenopause where it's gotten progressively you know kind of i just feel a little more uncomfortable every time which is why Mm -hmm. i now force myself whenever i can i'm like out and i'm driving so no. and as so, as long as you do it gradually and within your comfort level you should be fine so and i think like with any skill if you stop swimming and you get back into the pool after a drowning accident you know you may never get back you have to get back on the horse but do it within your own comfort level at your own pace there's no point pushing yourself but i think the reason why i mentioned driving as well is you know during perimenopause women they overloaded at home you know between kids yes. and elderly parents they have husband, yep. a partner, and they need some breathing space. They need to go out, get some fresh air. And if you don't drive or, I mean, you don't have to drive. You can go out for a walk. I mean, I don't drive at the moment, but you could go out for a walk, but it helps clear your head. So it is a very important part of, you know, having your own space. It's a safe space within the car. You can listen to a podcast like yours, yes. or you can listen to a music. You can do, or, you know, listen to headspace or calm, like a mindfulness music, whatever. So it's having your own space where you are in control. And even if it means just going five minutes down the road, going to a parking lot and sitting there for 20 minutes, I don't care, you know, as long as you get your me time uninterrupted. Well, I think too, well, it's basically what you just said. It's the freedom, right? Yeah. But also we can fall into this learned helplessness where pretty soon we can't really drive anywhere unless there's someone with us. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it's the confidence thing as well. And learned helplessness is is one of the depressive symptoms. It's a, it's how the, uh, it's a negative automatic thought that comes in women with depression. You know, you think, oh, you know, I'm not good at this. So, you know, if you think, okay, I'm good, I'm not good socially and I'm not good at, uh, you know, you're not going to go out or go to meet new people, go to parties if you're invited, because you have told yourself you're not good at this. You're bad at networking. You're bad at X or Y or Z. 
dead and it's a vicious cycle so it's down to you and the whole premise of even things like CBT which is the cognitive behavioral therapy is how you can challenge these negative automatic thoughts the learned helplessness through action or behavior so you do something you can suddenly change the neural pathways to kind of help you think differently because once you're on the road or once you've done something which you thought were bad you suddenly think oh wow okay if i can do this maybe i can do xyz as well okay maybe it's, things are not as bad so i think it just gives you a bit more hope and freedom i think so going back to adhd symptoms i'm curious what were you like as a child are there things now that with the benefit of hindsight you know symptoms that you see or that you saw in yourself as a child that you think well maybe there was some adhd there uh it's a tough one i think probably the impulsivity and in attention but i think you see the inattention it was very interest based so you know if i yep. didn't like anything i wouldn't do it and there was no point taking me and dragging me anywhere and you know the, uh, I, i wouldn't do it and probably i think some of the things that did help i think going back in hindsight is you know i took my parents uh sent me and my sister to some dance classes when we were like six or seven i think you know the adhd the in coordination that side of things was held with the dance because you see you develop that kind of rhythm and coordination so i think if i didn't dance probably those things some things would have kind of become apparent you know going into my pubertal years uh, the other thing i would probably say is learning languages i lived you know in the middle east and then i moved to asia when i was 10 and then been to the uk when i was 25 so when you have to transit through different countries you become very adaptable you have to learn different languages so i think learning different languages going to new places me- meeting people from different cultures kept that boredom away because otherwise i think if i was stuck in one place lived in the same village uh, i would probably be bored to death and i think it's all down to how you view yourself and how you view the world so it's kind of your map of the world is different when you're exposed to these things as a child i mean i still hate changes you know if i have to move airbnbs on holiday i get frustrated i don't sleep <laughs> so you know that is there as well because you see it's that control and not knowing yeah. that uncertainty and women they like to know and i find that the older they get they get more controlling and they like more certainty but you have to be very flexible but i think like i said probably it was the inattention and the impulsivity as a kid but i think it was controlled and tempered uh because of the things i mentioned were you were you headstrong uh i think so i mean i'm one, the thing as well is i'm one of a twin and you see uh, and uh, she's a doctor as well growing up you see we never and we never needed to interact with other kids i mean we didn't mm-hmm. need to we had friends mm-hmm. but we didn't need to so i think there was a lot of protection that way i think if we had normal non adhd you know kids as friends at school it would have become really apparent so i think you know growing up we believed there was nothing wrong with us i mean we never fitted in anyway anyway and because of so many other reasons but i think uh, being one of a twin there was that protectiveness and probably all these things were masked up until kind of later on in adult life. Well, and you had your your little community, right? So you saw your daughter, I mean your sister who was just like you. Yeah. And so of course, you were both perfect. Yeah, we were both perfect and we had our own uh, language and we had our own way of doing uh-huh. de- doing things and and you know, we both uh were really hard working students, you know. I think it was probably part of the uh, you mentioned ADHD symptoms I think it was part of people pleasing you know a lot of mm. uh, I think girls in ADHD especially in younger uh, age they are people pleasers and I think it's a learned behavior they learn that so you see then I think one of the things I thought was I don't want people to not like me as a kid is for example mm-hmm. you know I don't want them to hate me because I'm different so I would rather do things to please them or fit in and it doesn't help anyway because you're still going to stick out. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally agree with you on the dance. I think ballet saved my brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a lot of research now that shows, you know, that balance um balance is yeah. important and yeah. yeah. Neuroplasticity and all that. So I feel like exactly. ba- ballet actually grew my brain in a different way. <laughs> 
No, I would totally agree. Some sort of uh, rhythmic dancing or some mm -hmm. sort of activity that involves coordination. The other thing we used to play was badminton. So it's a sport which involves quick reflexes. So I think it helped with any executive function, anything that lagged behind was helped with these activities. So I think any uh, mothers out there with kids with ADHD, get them to do some sort of sport or dance uh, and get them to learn different languages. I think it will help them a long way. What has changed since you were diagnosed? I think I'm more compassionate with myself. So I think that's the main thing. I think if you know yourself better, you have more compassion and patience with yourself. So now if I can't, if I can't do things perfectly or if I don't get things right, uh, you know, at home or in the organizational side of things, if I'm a bit behind, I'm compassionate. Okay, that's fine, Susan. Uh, also, if there's things you know, I'm facing uncertainty about. It's like, mm, that's okay. It's okay to not know. It's okay to just go with the flow. And so I think giving myself compassion, giving myself patience, giving myself the time to be me. And I think even rediscovering who the new Susan's going to be like, after kind of once she's kind of through these curves of perimenopause and ADHD, I think you have to give yourself room. And I think you will have to disappoint a lot of people and rocking the boat. You, yeah. you have to be willing to do it. I think it's one of those crucial phases in your life. You can't please everyone and you have to be willing to rock the boat and, you know, friendships, relationships around you. The, because the way people see you has changed, the way you see yourself has changed. Yeah. You can't please everyone, so you may as well please yourself. <laughs> exactly. And it's always, well, the saying I love is it's easier to uh, say sorry rather than say please. So when you ask for permission, that's where you run into trouble. If you upset someone, you can always say sorry at the end of the day. But you got to do what you think is right and uh, sits right with you. Yeah. And I'm sorry you feel that way, but I needed to do that for myself. <laughs> no, what, what is no, it? Okay. It's better to ask for, I say this all the time, and now I can't think of what it is. So it's, it's better. Easier, to so it's easier to say sorry rather than please. Yeah. There's, there's another way that it said something about it's better Probably. to ask for. Forgiveness, probably, yeah. For, yes, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission or something yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same lines. But I, you see, yeah, because I think you see women, the way they're uh, brought up by society, it's ingrained in them that they have to ask for permission. So, you know, look at boys or men, you know, including, uh, you know, men I've dated or, you know, male uh, doctors or colleagues. They hardly ask for permission. They just get on and do it. And if they get anything wrong, they'll say sorry. Women, they think they have to be perfect to start anything, do anything. And even the whole uh, ADHD menopause uh, coaching advisory service, I just launched it a couple of months ago. And in my own head, I'd been incubating this for a few months. But for me to get it out there, I thought, okay, no one's writing about it. It's not very well known. What if I am have to go first? And what if people will say X, Y, Z? And, you know, I'm afraid what of criticism you know the rsd the rejection sensitivity is high in adhd and i think that's a trait i can identify with because you're afraid of rejection you know rejection from peers from family yeah. friends you know what will they think or who the hell is she to go out and say you know there's a correlation because there are not many studies out there that have done it most of it is anecdotal so but yeah. you have to whatever you believe in i think you have to have the balls to get out there and do it and you know there's only one way to know if it'll work if it if it works, it works. If it fails, it fails. And there's always a next step or a next thing you can do. Right. And you learn something from it. So you take that and move on to exactly. the next thing. But you yeah. won't. You won't fail. <laughs> 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 I get so many women in the UK and, you know, and just yeah. everywhere in the world that yeah. Yeah. they're just so frustrated because people, they well, me the medical professionals don't know about ADHD and they're just constantly yeah. being directed yeah. in the wrong place. And yeah. Okay. So let's talk about what has worked for your patients to reduce hmm. ADHD symptoms and balance their hormones. And we're talking about those patients that come to you with perimenopause and or menopause type issues and ADHD symptoms that have been exacerbated because of it. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, identifying which one it is more likely to be. I mean, I guess it all stems down to a good history taking, you know, as doctors, that's I would probably say that's the, the trait of a good doctor to be kind of a good listener. So listening to the woman, 
if they come with both, you see, ideally, you don't want to treat both ADHD and perimenopause or menopause at the same time, because you mm-hmm. can't really then tell which one has worked. So ideally, you would want to go with what the woman is more affected with. So if it is more the physical symptoms of the hormones or the perimenopause, which could be the hot flashes, the sleep problems, the weight gain, uh, you know, loss of libido, all those kind of things, then you would probably want to focus more on the hormone and the estrogen replacement or the hormone replacement therapy. On the other hand, if they were struggling more with the cognitive effects and it was more ADHD symptoms, you would probably want them to go and get a diagnosis, see a psychiatrist or a specialist who specializes in it. And because there's that overlap, you really don't know which one needs to be treated first. You have to ask the woman, see what You know, because women have a very strong instinct of what they think will work for them as well. But I think it's knowing that there are two variables in this equation. It could be physical of the hormones. It could be the hormones causing the cognitive symptoms. It could be the ADHD playing up as well. So ideally, if you have the resources, you would want to send them to both a hormone specialist or a menopause specialist and uh, also a ADHD specialist as well. So you can know where they stand, you know, be it blood work with, you know, the hormones, be it the ADHD assessment. You know, they don't have to start treatment with any of these things, but if you know where they're at ADHD-wise or hormone-wise, then you get a better idea. The problem that happens a lot when there is overlap is you see the ADHD specialist won't know a thing about hormones. The hormone specialist won't know a thing about ADHD. So then the system is very fragmented. And where does this woman go? Who can you know connect all the dots between the mind and the body? And I think that's where I thought I could come in and my service is more of a signposting. You know, I'm not a specialist in ADHD or menopause. I'm a family physician. I'm a general practitioner. It's more of my own interest, things that I've learned for myself, which I can impart. But I think someone who can look at the big picture, look at the whole picture and tell this woman, you know what, you know, this is what the hormone specialist has said or the menopause specialist. This is what the ADHD is assessment has shown and then the the woman can make an informed decision you know what to do next where to go you need to kind of break it down really there is no one answer fits all i'm you know unfortunately and every woman is different and you know i could be a twin and my twin would be completely different but you see every woman is different and you, they have to be heard separately listened to intently and then only can you arrive at the right solution for them So you are basically, I don't know, almost operating like a coach where you're helping them just a very educated coach who (laughs) um, is helping them decipher all of these medical reports and information that they're getting, helping them synthesize and maybe process what they should do first, second, third. Take second thought. And then you see the the menopause specialist say, for example, tells them, you know, I think maybe it's good you try xyz medications and then the adhd specialist turns around and say you know what you might benefit from some stimulants and but the woman woman doesn't know because no one's asked her about any of her other medical history likely i mean i'm not saying they usually do during these assessments but you know there might be many other factors in play but they don't know where to start first and when you see these specialists then they're told okay what we'll follow up in six months what do you do between month one and one month six they are completely lost and they are in this kind of completely unknown field where they're kind of lost and no, don't know, don't have support because a lot of the specialists are super specialists. So you really need a generalist who can break down the information in a digestible format and give it to the woman and, and you know, empower her to make the right decisions for herself. So the signpost is, you know what, you can go down route A, you can go down A, B, C, D. It could be any of them. If, you know, my theory is if you go down route A and it doesn't work after six months, there's no harm in trying route B. So nothing is finite. Science is not finite either. So you have to be willing to try and listen to your own body, uh, look at the evidence, look at what is helping, what is not, and be honest about it. You know, my frustration in all of this has been how it's not integrative. Just exactly what you said. Everybody knows their one little area, but they don't know anything beyond that. 
And yeah. so it, it's, it almost becomes impossible. And even within ADHD, yeah. we have okay. this idea that, okay, it's just ADHD. And mm. so then the per people who know ADHD don't know anything about dyslexia. And the people exactly. who don't know anything about dyslexia don't know anything about visual processing. I mean, it's yeah. just nobody knows at all. And so it sounds like what you're doing, certainly around hormones, women, ADHD, is integrating it or helping yeah. your, I guess, clients, it would be, yeah, versus yeah. patients, right? Yeah, your clients yeah. integrate. So does that mean, I would suspect, because women are probably pretty similar all over the world, that yeah. your expertise is not just limited to clients in uh, the UK or where were you? You're in London and you're in... Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I spent time between London and Dubai. Uh, Dubai. But, but, you know, I could consult uh, fr from this uh, coaching advisory service. I could consult with a woman from anywhere in the world, really. Yeah. Because, that's because I think, it, I mean, the structures and, you know, the specialists in each country may differ, but the mm -hmm. premise still remains the same. The fundamentals uh, I would probably operate on would still be pretty much the same, but it can be tailored. I mean, I think which is why I think having grown up in different parts of the world, you kind of can relate to most people in the world because, you know, you've seen them all through your upbringing and the variety of it. And you, you have the confidence, you know, you can understand them culturally. You get, Because you see culture plays a huge part, you know, the stigma around things. And, you know, some women might not speak up openly about it. You know, US, I, would, I was speaking to my ADHD coach the other day and I was telling her, you know, the US is very well advanced ADHD wise. Uh, but, uh, but I think the UK has a head start menopause wise. But then where do you mm -hmm. go if you need both? So it is yeah. kind of that kind of in-between area, that kind of shades of gray. No one likes the shades of gray. Everything is black and white, you see, and everyone likes well, Especially black and white. in medicine, right? Yeah, and, you know, and everyone likes to operate within the remit of black and white. When it comes mm -hmm. to gray, it's like people are not sure, and, peop and a lot of professionals don't like the gray areas, to be honest. But I think willingness to go there, because if you have been there yourself, then it's easier to guide someone along the same journey or a similar journey rather. So I have a question for you. Sure. I'm curious if you have seen this in your clients at all where, mm -hmm. okay, initially I was told it's perimenopause, hormone mm -hmm. replacement therapy. I tried hormone replacement therapy and all different kinds of supplements and they literally just made me nuts. I have also not been successful with ADHD uh, medication, specifically mm -hmm. stimulant medication, actually any of them. I've tried yeah. just about everything. Have you seen that be fairly consistent where if hormone replacement therapy doesn't work, that often, you know, other kinds of, you know, well, ADHD medication doesn't either? Mm. It's not, it can be seen in some women. I, I would probably say that is usually the case when there is more serious stuff involved. So say, for example, there's a history of trauma. So trauma mm -hmm. is a big one, you see, because it kind of causes imbalance in the hormonal system right from uh, the age of the trauma. And when yep. you have trauma inbuilt, it affects the cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Uh, it affects the pituitary gland in the brain, which regulates the sex hormones. And then you have the defect on the brain from the dopamine. You have all this stuff. So trauma, you know, for me, is like a gaslight. It just lights everything on fire. So and and uh, women may not respond to either of those things until and unless the trauma is resolved either through trauma therapy, EMDR, which is a specialized form of therapy, but some mm -hmm. sort of intervention to resolve the trauma. So it is like there's this huge layer kind of where the treatments of the hormones or the ADHD treatments, it's impervious. So it's not going to penetrate through the wall of trauma. So that's how I would see it. So I think in those women, unless the trauma is treated, resolved, or in, on some level, the treatments of hormones, ADHD may not be effective. Also, the case is if there's anything physical going on, say, for example, physical-wise, thyroid issues would be a common one, uh, or autoimmune for that reason. And, you know, anything autoimmune, anything thyroid where there's chronic inflammation, you may not get the results of the intended results of hormone therapy. And going to the ADHD side of things, if there's more underlying mental health stuff like depression, anxiety, I don't know, 
OCD traits, any of those things, if there are. Because, you know, ADHD never travels alone. You know, there's always a comorbidity with it. So it's identifying what is the most likely compatriot of ADHD in that woman. Most likely it might be anxiety, it might be OCD, it might be personality disorder. We don't know. I think you would have to break it down and go to the roots to find out if things are not working. So if traditional treatment, either in a hormone space or a ADHD space doesn't work, you have to go back to scratch and start again. You know, I don't know what it is, but I suspect that, and I never thought I had anxiety. I, you know, mm. I say this often, I always thought I just caused other people anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't until perimenopause that, and honestly, it was all the hormone therapy. And they told me you have a thyroid disorder, which I did not have. Yeah. They put me on Cytomel and I went hyper. Yeah. Okay. And that is what then, so there must've been some latent anxiety, right? That mm -hmm. I just, I never, I, I didn't know that I had. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think it's kind of what has driven me to. Yeah. But that triggered something where all of a sudden then anxiety became something that I had to worry about. And mm -hmm. the anxiety, normally, I, I'm able to manage it just fine with exercise, but mm -hmm. trying all these different medications is what just created more anxiety. And I mm -hmm. am a slow metabolizer. Yeah. And so I yeah. think it's almost that we cannot get the medication up high enough mm -hmm. without making me anxious so that it affects yeah. my symptoms, if that makes sense. No, I totally agree. And, you know, and then you might have to take out all the medications and go back to, you know, grassroots level. So like you mentioned, it might be exercise. It might be looking at your diet, yeah. your sleep. And that's what I've done. <laughs> yeah, alcohol, which is where the whole lifestyle medicine approach comes in, you know, from my training. And it's kind of, you know, you go to the basics. You know, how's your sleep? Do you smoke? Do you drink? You like a glass mm -hmm. of wine? You know, that's not going to help you with your anxiety, you know. Alcohol is a downer, it increases your anxiety, lowers your mood. So obviously that's not going to work. So you'd have to cut down on those things. You know, exercise helps, mindfulness helps. So, you know, it's, I think you have to declutter your life, I think, uh, when you're in that stage. Yeah. And go down to basics and re-examine re everything from the ropes. Yeah. I've, I've given up on medication. I wish I was one of those people that, you know, when I had something really difficult to do, I could... Stimulant medication would work for me, but I've given up on it and I've, I've had to, like you said, focus on sleep and exercise and making sure I'm living my purpose. And yeah. how, about, how about supplements? Are there any supplements that you've seen that your clients have had a lot of success with? I mean, supplements is not that well uh, researched either in ADHD or hormones. There are some supplements, uh, you know, there's black cohosh, you know, there's a few different mm -hmm. ones that people try and use. But I think it depends on the woman, really. You see, some of them have a placebo effect as well. There are women who's, who swear by, you know, black cohosh, red clover. Uh, there's another one, the Australian uh, bush essence oil, you know, the, there's a flower treatment. So, you know, all sorts mm -hmm. of things that help with the anxiety and the sleep and stuff. And you give it to another woman and she'll probably say, oh, no, that made me feel really bad. You know, CBD oil, that is a new one. You know, a lot of women use. I think that, I think, I mean, there's not much evidence, but I think a lot of women I've uh, met and uh, uh, they have kind of vouched for CBD oil. It kind of helps with the inattention side of things with ADHD and improves the focus in some women, but it also helps with the sleep and lowering the anxiety. So, you know, potentially that could be one, but you have to be careful. It has to be a good quality uh, CBD oil. I mean, I've, uh, you know, there are gummies and things that you can use, but every woman is different. There is no blanket yeah. approach to these things. You have to know the history of the woman, actually, which is why I think it goes back to, you know, speaking to her, listening to her properly, getting the whole story, because there are clues all the way right from childhood to adolescence, you know, what their periods were like, how were they hormonally, you know, did they have acne, you know, period problems, endometriosis, fibroids, you know, there could be so many clues dotted along their lifespan, which will give you a lot of clues as to what might potentially work for them. And, you know, from a stress side of things, there are so many adaptogens like rhodiola, there is uh, ashwagandha, you know, all those things help with the cortisol level and kind of help with the sleep and stress and stuff. So there are so many things, but I think you, you're probably better off seeing a nutritionist or someone qualified in that area 
you know, I can give pointers, but I wouldn't be able to say, you know, this is exactly the right thing for you. I think you're probably better off seeing someone who has experienced dealing with you and, you know, providing a bespoke kind of nutritious plan. So I work with some of some nutritionists, you know, who are able to do that. Yeah. No, I, it makes sense. Again, every single woman is different. Every single yeah. ADHD woman is different. You know, our brains, uh, yeah, you're making perfect sense. So one last question. I hmm. have this theory. It's not, well, it's the last question before I ask you those last questions that I always ask. <laughs> okay. I have this theory that ADHD women care more about, care more than most about living to their potential. I did hmm. a little study in our group. Hmm. Oh, probably about a year ago. And it was literally 98% of women that responded felt like they they just cared more about mm. living a life of meaning than their peers. Mm. Um, mm. And so my theory is when we're not living to our purpose, when we're not practicing our creativity, mm. we don't feel good. Mm. And when they come to me, most of them don't even know what the formula is for them to feel better. But once they mm. discover what's important to them, what their values are, what their strengths, passions, mm. and purpose are, mm. they mm. immediately feel so much better. So I believe that it's not just medication. It's not just knowing it's ADHD and how does my ADHD brain work, but it's also understanding you know, who they are in all this and what their purpose is, that it's multifaceted. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. I would totally agree. I think the the underlying uh, belief in more, a lot of ADHD is, especially women, tends to be you know they were made uh, neurodiverse for a reason. You know the reason they have ADHD superpowers, like a you know uh, like you call them, it's it's for so that they can look at things differently, do things differently, and see the big picture, connect the dots where most of the non-ADHD people wouldn't be able to see the patterns. So if you're given, it's kind of like if you see ADHD as a gift, then you would want to make sure you perform to the best potential because it's like, you know, you're only probably going to be 10 or 20% of the whole population in the world. So if you're built that way, there must be reason why and where do you then fit in in the world, you know, professionally, personally, what is your role, what is your purpose? And the whole thing with it's the same, not just with ADHD, perimenopause, it's the whole, it's like your second birth, you know, if you're reliving your adolescence, you're going, you're getting the chance to choose again. So what would you choose differently? You know, what would you do differently? And, you know, what, yeah. So, and I think a lot of the women, they feel empowered that they can make a difference I think and making a difference is a huge part of how ADHD women feel good about themselves. And it kind of ticks the box in their heart, you know what, I'm living my purpose because I can make a difference. I can be heard and seen. I think hiding is a big part of ADHD, especially in women. So I think when women have a voice and they can, you know, get that voice out, you know, uh, by speaking, singing, writing, uh, you know, the way they bring up their kids, uh, you know, the way they do their job, you know, whatever it is, or their creativity, then they have a voice, then they're no longer hiding. And a lot of the shame associated with ADHD, perimenopause goes away when you stop hiding. And it's really difficult at the start. And, you know, you have to push yourself through it. And once you stop hiding, it starts to get easier. And you have, you have to not care what people think. I think that's the gist. You have to follow, you know, it's your own compass in your heart, which tells you, okay, this is where I need to go. The compass of joy, I think that's what I read in a book. You follow the compass of joy. So the little things that give you joy, you keep doing more of it, then you'll slowly realize your purpose. So that's what you follow. And if you're lost, you do one thing that makes you a little bit happier, then you'll know the following day, you might get another idea. So it's just one step at a time. You can't rush the process uh, because it's a transformation, the metamorphosis, you know, from, you know, the whole usual caterpillar to butterfly thing. It's going to take time. It's really painful, but it's that end product you live for. The butterfly is so beautiful. It's free. It can fly. People admire it, look at it and say, wow, okay, look at its beautiful colors. So that's the vision you have to have in your own head of yourself, your future self. That's what keeps you going. I love it. So Susan, what is your number one ADHD workaround? I think being flexible and adaptable wherever you do it. And I think yoga and mindfulness, two things that help me stay flexible. You know, they say how you end up on the yoga mat is how you end up in life. 
uh, on that day, even that, yeah. So on that day, if you go on a yoga mat and you are really feeling really stiff and rigid, you know mentally you're stiff and rigid that day. So you create that flexibility in your mind and your body, then you're flexible to your environment. And that is a key with succeeding, especially when you're going through such tr- difficult transitions. You have to stay flexible, uh, always be adjusting, you know, tuning in to your body, to what your mind says, uh, being aware of things around you. So I would say yoga and mindfulness. I use uh, I used to use Headspace, but now I use something called Calm. Every morning, first thing, 10 minutes. It's just easy to just switch off everything. And, you know, you wake up to this really loud chatter in your brain of 101 things to do. Uh, so the 10 minutes in the morning makes all the difference, I think, for me. I agree. So where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Hmm. Uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn or in Instagram. Uh, so they can find me on Dr. It's at Dr. Susan Vargas. That's the Instagram. And okay, LinkedIn say that is, again. Oh, at? So at uh, Dr. D.R. Susan Vargas. So it's okay, my name. Spell Vargas for us. Uh, so V-A-R-G-H-E-S-E. Okay. Yeah. And uh, LinkedIn is the same. If you just type in my name on LinkedIn, it'll show up. Uh, I've got a website as well. So it's www.drsusanvargis.com. Ah, you made it very easy for us. Um, <laughs> I, I think consistency, I've, it's something I've had to do. So it's easy and you know people can remember things easily. When you start switching and changing so many variables, it's very hard to, and you have to be remembered, you see, I think remembered uh, easily. So I think I just wanted to make my life easy, which is why it is streamlined that way. Wonderful. Okay, so everything is basically Dr. Susan Var- Vargas. Vargas. Yeah, Vargas, yeah. yeah. Bar days. Okay. Yeah. So um, again, this is going to be in the show notes um, if you've missed it. Susan, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I so appreciate you and what you do. Thank you so much, Tracy, for having me. And I hope uh, the listeners have had some sort of benefit. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm full of supporting women and empowering women to live their best lives. So, and thank you, Tracy, for the good work you do. So you started the talk for me. So um, it's a pleasure for me to be back here on this platform. So Wonderful. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Dr. Susan Vargas, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews really help. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.